Cathay Pacific will merge some flights over the coming weeks to prevent flight disruptions at short notice. And more than 170 Boeing 737 MAX 9 jetliners grounded worldwide in the wake of Friday's Alaska Airlines incident. Good evening and thank you for joining us. After numerous flight cancellations over the Christmas holidays, Cathay Pacific is working to prevent flight disruptions during the Lunar New Year travel peak. But that's by cutting more flights and merging them with others over the coming weeks. Affected passengers have to switch flights or apply for a refund. Over the Christmas holiday, Cathay Pacific came under fire for having cancelled upwards of 20 flights in one day. With just a month away from another peak travel season, the Chinese New Year holiday, the city's flagship carrier says it's learned the lesson. Cathay will consolidate an average of six pairs of flights a day from the remainder of this month through February, mainly on busier routes. Such consolidation means some flights would be cancelled over the coming weeks. It's understood affected routes encompass destinations in the mainland and Southeast Asia, including Beijing, Shanghai, Taipei, Singapore and Bangkok as well as mid- to long-haul flights with relatively low passenger loads, including Bangladesh and Dubai UAE. Ms. Wang, who has planned to fly to Singapore with Cathay today, said she only received a notice from CX last night that her flight was cancelled and she had to rebook another flight. She said she might consider choosing other airlines if cancellations get more frequent. It's understood the latest raft of flights are cancelled to make sure enough staff can report to duty during the Lunar New Year travel peak. This as pilots can't work if their cumulative flight hours exceed the 100-hour limit. Cathay has also rostered more standby pilots. But the Hong Kong Air Crew Officers Association said these new measures might not be effective because some flights still have to be caught off. The association said the crux of the problem remains Cathay's manpower crunch, exacerbated by the airline's overly ambitious goal to reach 70 percent of the pre-pandemic flight capacity. When you're very short of staff and you set yourself these ambitious targets, it's the sort of thing that happens. Any small disruption has a knock-on effect, and there's no real resilience in the system. There's no real um, ability for the system to absorb these changes. They knock on, and they end up cancelling more than just one flight. They end up having to cancel a series of flights. The Air Crew Association said to ensure stable flight operations over the long term, Cathay has to improve its existing remuneration to retain and hire more staff. Financial Secretary Paul Chan struck a tone of confidence today in the city's efforts to ensure robust public finances. This as Hong Kong recorded an estimated budget deficit of around $140 billion in fiscal year 2022-23. To boost government income, Chan said there could be reviews over users' pay public services and other fees that have not been adjusted for a long time. Public consultation underway for the upcoming budget proposals, which are poised to be unveiled next month. In his latest blog post, Financial Secretary Paul Chan said the public believe there should be a balanced budget, but also a need to seize the opportunities to promote economic growth and development, as well as further improving people's livelihoods. He said the government had devoted a lot of resources on anti-pandemic efforts over the past few years, and now is the time to enter a period of expenditure consolidation. While expressing determination towards achieving fiscal balances, Chen admitted the process should be realistic and done at the right pace with ample communication with the public. The city's most vulnerable should continue to have access to basic public services and sufficient support. But as Hong Kong is focusing on growing the economy, wooing businesses and trawling talent, he said generating government revenue should not affect the city's momentum of recovery. And it's essential that Hong Kong maintains its advantages of a simple and low-tax regime. The finance chief reviewed possible targets to boost government income. They include certain public service fees that have not been adjusted for a long time, and some services provided under the user pays principle, which are falling short of their costs. The finance chief said in the long run, the key is to make the cake bigger in the city's push for a robust economic growth. More than 190 Boeing 737 MAX 9 jetliners remain grounded worldwide after part of the fuselage of an Alaska Airlines plane fell off mid-air over America. No one was seriously injured. Investigations continue into what happened to the jet that had to make an emergency landing in Portland. David Garrett has more.
A hole on the left side of Alaska Airlines Flight 1282. Passengers remained calm as the service from Portland to Ontario, California was forced to turn back. Part of the fuselage, including a window, blew out when the plane reached 16,000 feet only 10 minutes after takeoff. A terrifying moment for those inside. I'm sleeping and I just feel the plane drop and it wasn't like any other turbulence just because the masks had came down too. So that's when I knew like, oh gosh, this is something way different. Um, and yeah, I started freaking out. Showed you how structurally strong those planes are. You could blow a hole like that because the hole was about as wide as a refrigerator and about two thirds as high when I finally got to see it later. We just heard like a loud thing or like a boom. And I look up and the air masks are like out, pop down, and I look to my left, and there's just this huge, like, gaping hole. Everything went swell. Um, like I said, the cabin crew were, did an excellent job. Pilot did a great job. Um, can't say anything bad about them at all. Fortunately, no one was sitting near the window that blew out. Those empty seats were damaged. Clothing and phones were sucked out as the cabin depressurized. No one was injured, with all passengers and crews seated because the plane was ascending and the seatbelt signs were on. The National Transportation Safety Board knows this could have been much worse. Fortunately, they were not at cruise altitude of 30,000 or 30, 35,000 feet, feet. Think about what happens when you're in cruise. Everybody's up and walking. Folks don't have seatbelts on. Uh, they're going to uh, restrooms. The flight attendants are providing service to passengers. We could have end up with, ended up with something so much more tragic and we're really fortunate that that did not occur here. Manufacturer Boeing is supporting the investigation with nearly 200 of its planes grounded. The search is on for the missing part of the aircraft to aid investigators. It is believed to be somewhere west of Portland. I think it is of note that the aircraft was a very new aircraft, only produced and entered service a couple of months ago in November 2023. Of course, we would not expect to see such an event on any aircraft, uh, no matter what age in service, with a, a good maintenance regime. Alaska Airlines cancelled 15% of its flights. There was disruption at several airports with thousands of travellers inconvenienced. Alaska Airlines CEO said in a statement that safety checks could take a few days. He went on to write that his heart goes out to those on board and he was sorry for what they had experienced. David Garrett, TVB News. Israel and Lebanon-based Hezbollah stepped up attacks against each other amid diplomatic efforts to prevent conflict in Gaza from spreading regionally. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell are in the Middle East, trying to cool down tensions with Hezbollah. Yemen's Houthi group Iran and Iraqi mili militias threatening to escalate matters. Gaza officials say more than 22,700 have been killed since October 7th, when Hamas and other groups raided Israel, resulting in the deaths of 1,200 people and prompting Israel to launch an all-out offensive. Nasvi Karim has more. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Jordan and European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell in Beirut, both in the Middle East on a frantic diplomatic quest to prevent the Israel-Hamas conflict from escalating into a wider regional war. This as Israel and Lebanon's Hezbollah group on Saturday engaged in one of the heaviest days of cross-border fighting since October 7th. The assassination last Tuesday of Hamas Deputy Political Chief Saleh al aruri in Beirut has inflamed tensions with Hezbollah and Hamas vowing revenge. Blinken arrived in Jordan on Sunday as part of a nine-stop trip, having visited Turkey and Greece, and saying Ankara can play a positive role as a regional influencer. Turkey, we also focused uh, extensively on uh, what Turkey can do, using its influence, using its ties, to help prevent the conflict in the Middle East uh, from spreading. Uh, and we also talked about the role that Turkey can play, both in the day after for Gaza, in terms of uh, the challenging questions of governance, Palestinian-led governance, uh, security, rebuilding, as well as the work that it can do with others to try to produce more lasting, durable peace and security uh, in the region. Amid the diplomatic efforts, Israel said it had struck targets inside southern Lebanon, while Hezbollah fired rockets into northern Israel. Hezbollah said two of its fighters were killed, taking the group's death toll since October 7 to 150. Borrell wants to launch a European-Arab initiative to revive a process leading to a two-state solution. 
is the time to make uh, our idea of two-state solution a reality. Otherwise, the cycle of violence will continue, generation after generation, funerals after funerals, because you cannot kill an idea. You can kill people, but you cannot kill an idea. The only way of killing a bad idea is to bring a good one. And the good one is to make the Palestinians and the Israelis living together in peace and security, sharing the land. Meanwhile, Israel's military, the IDF, said it has dismantled Hamas's military framework in northern Gaza, killing around 8,000 of their fighters. The IDF said it has also seized tens of thousands of weapons and millions of documents and are on track to achieve its goal of crippling Hamas, which rules Gaza. Gaza health authorities say 122 people were killed in the previous 24 hours. Twelve died in a strike in central Gaza, while the Palestinian Red Crescent reported heavy shelling near the Al-Amal hospital in the southern region of Khan Yunus. Nazri Karim, TVB News. U.S. President Joe Biden will give his annual State of the Union address on March 7th. In a letter sent out to the White House on Saturday, House Speaker Mike Johnson extended the formal invitation for Biden to speak to a joint session of Congress. It will offer an opportunity for Biden to detail his broader vision and priorities as he campaigns for re-election in November. It also takes place after two critical deadlines to avert a government shutdown on January 19th and February 2nd. The annual address is usually scheduled for late January or February. Biden's on March 7th will be the latest since President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1934. Last year, Biden declared that he would finish the job of his agenda, such as capping insulin costs for all Americans, taking more aggressive actions on climate change, banning assault-style weapons and pushing for higher taxes on corporations and the rich. Also in the United States, there are new questions tonight. Why Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's hospitalization was kept secret from the public? And according to the latest information from President Joe Biden for several days as well. This comes amid new details that Austin was not only hospitalized, but also in ICU. More on that from NBC News. Tonight, a U.S. official confirms to NBC News that the Pentagon did not inform senior officials in the White House's National Security Council for three days that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had been hospitalized at Walter Reed Medical Center on New Year's Day. The news not shared with the American public until Friday, when the Pentagon announced that Austin was hospitalized for complications following a recent elective medical procedure. And NBC News has learned the 70-year-old Austin not just hospitalized, but also in the intensive care unit for at least four days, according to two senior administration officials. Asked why his stay wasn't disclosed sooner, a Pentagon spokesperson tells NBC News, this has been an evolving situation in which we had to consider a number of factors, adding Secretary Austin is recovering well and he resumed his full duties. The Pentagon declining to explain what Austin's procedure was and what complications occurred. The lack of information strongly criticized. When presidents have issues, the other cabinet members have issues, the public is notified. So there's no real justification. It's unacceptable. America's commitment to Israel is unwavering. The secretary in Israel as recently as mid-December, as its war with Hamas raises tension in the Middle East. On Thursday, the U.S. carried out a strike that killed an Iran-backed militia member in Iraq while Austin was hospitalized. The defense secretary taking full responsibility for what he says were his decisions about disclosure, saying in part, quote, I recognize I could have done a better job ensuring the public was appropriately informed. I commit to doing better. And still ahead. The medical expert says the winter flu peak season has technically begun in the city. Some local pig farms saw their animals cold because of African swine fever, with seven of them in Yunlong. What do they have in common? And the first ever Walk for Millions event on the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. Welcome back. 
Medical expert David Ho today said it is not necessary to reintroduce a mask wearing mandate for the city. Ho's comment comes after health authorities said Hong Kong will this week hit a peak for the winter influenza season and a new variant of COVID 19. Memo Senai reports. The Center for Health Protection last week warned the public about a peak in the winter influenza season, adding it may coincide with increasing infections of a new COVID-19 variant, JM.1. Speaking on a TVB program, respiratory expert David Ho said the city will likely end the peak period for winter influenza this week. He said latest laboratory statistics show respiratory specimens testing positive for seasonal influenza viruses have exceeded the baseline of 9.2 percent. Hoi warns of serious consequences for those struck by influenza and COVID-19 at the same time. If someone happened to be infected with both COVID-19 and influenza, then there is actually increased risk of the respiratory failure. And there is also a higher chance of uh, in-hospital mortality. So I need to emphasize that the high-risk groups, like elderly people who have chronic illness, people who have immunocompromised condition, they should actually receive the uh, seasonal flu vaccine and also COVID vaccine. Hoi meanwhile said he believes it is not necessary to make everyone wear a mask again. After the major outbreak in the fifth wave, we have developed hybrid immunity in the community. So people who have been infected and they also receive vaccinations. So the disease actually is getting milder. So instead of reintroducing the masking mandate, I would actually encourage the high-risk populations to protect themselves by wearing a mask and pay attention to hand hygiene when they go to crowded areas. While the new COVID-19 variant, JM.1, is more transmissible, its severity has not increased. Hoi said people inoculated against XBB should not panic about JM.1 because the vaccines can produce antibodies and neutralize the variant. Mims 9, TVB News. The Hong Kong Livestock Industry Association says African swine fever has not affected the supply and price of locally produced pork. Between November last year and this month, about 14,000 pigs were culled in the city after African swine fever was found on eight local pig farms, seven in Yunlong and one in Shangshui. This is an animal carcass collection point near an affected pig farm in Lao Fao Shan in the Yunlong district. Some pig farm owners say pig carcasses are dumped at collection points after being wrapped in plastic bags. All seven affected pig farms in Yunlong share something in common. common. They are all located along the same pig carcass location route. Chairman of the city's Livestock Industry Association Chang Chung Ping said the spread of the African swine fever virus could have been caused by farm workers' insufficient sanitation of their shoes or clothing. Chief Executive John Lee today attended a special walk on the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the community chest. The CE was joined on the Walk for Millions event by officials, guests and more than 11,000 people. The journey was six kilometers long and took about two hours to complete. This is the first time that the walk was held on the mega bridge. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.